Hello! Welcome to Why Not Both. My name is Pam Schaefer, and I'm a musician and therapist in Los Angeles. Why Not Both is all about how our multiple passions inform our identity. And this season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar Magazine and produced by Laura Studeris. If you like what you hear, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and come spend time with us on social media. We are at WNB the podcast, and that is both on Instagram and on Twitter. For this episode, we had the pleasure of chatting with the utterly wonderful Jarvis Cocker. He requests that while you're listening to this interview, you head over and support Extinction Rebellion, which is linked in the description of this podcast episode. I hope you enjoy our chat. Well, Jarvis, welcome to Why Not Both. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, usually the first question I ask people is, what do you do? But especially now, that seems like a very silly question. So I guess I would pause it. What's a better question than what do you do? You could ask me, what am I doing right now? Ooh, what are you doing right now? Um, well, I'm, I'm in a strange uh, a stage of the lockdown, I suppose. For, for, for the first part of it, I was in the English countryside. Mm -hmm. uh, and then two days ago, I came to Paris to look after my son. So. I'm now in a big city, and oh, wow. um, so that's been a big change because for the previous two months, I saw more sheep than people because the place <laughs> where I was, there were a lot of sheep. <laughs> it's uh, like you're in Iceland. A little bit like that, yeah, but it was, uh, and that was actually quite a nice antidote because um, the lockdown in the UK kind of coincis coincided with the lambing season, so there were lots of newborn lambs everywhere, which was a really kind of welcome antidote to the news that was on the TV that was all about death. And so it was nice to see new life coming. Um, I was going to say that sounds like charmingly idyllic. It was, yeah. And, and um, so that was, uh, it's, it's the countryside. It's quite near to Sheffield where I was born near my mum and my sister, although I couldn't see my mum and my sister, but I did see them. Right just before I left, mm -hmm. uh, so they were both okay. They both got mm -hmm. health issues that meant that they had to uh, keep isolated. So, mm. so yeah, so I feel like I've moved into a different stage because the, the day that I arrived in Paris, um, it was like it had all been a, an hallucination because unbeknownst to me, the day I came back was the day, that, this last Tuesday was when all the cafes and everything reopened. So. Oh my I came goodness. To the train station and I was walking and I was thinking, well, this looks just exactly the same as when I left. <laughs> so it was just like it was all a hoax or something. It was really crazy. That's uh, so surreal. <laughs> yeah. But um, I mean, people are still wearing masks. Maybe a third of the people you see on the street have got masks. And people generally put them on to go into a, a shop or something. Uh -huh. Or if they go on the on the on the sub you know on the metro or what yeah what was travel like it's a strange adjustment hmm. yeah i can't imagine like traveling through did you travel through london or how did you get there i i got someone to drive me down and then i just got on the train that you know the eurostar yeah yeah yeah, yeah. is we'll we'll let you go if you've got a good reason which you know looking after a child is a, is a good reason so yes yes yeah so that's how I got over. That is so very strange, though, to go to surrounded by lambs to then Paris reopened. Surrounded by frogs. <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, <laughs> that's so bizarre. Yeah, and like the reopening, I mean, do you feel comfortable with the reopening? It's, it's very strange because I guess in L.A. several things had just started to open despite the fact that the curve had not flattened as it were 
I basically had thought to myself when things started to reopen, I was like, I don't think I really trust outside 1.0. It's like, I think I want to wait until probably 2 or 3.0 when they really work things out. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I didn't have a choice because, uh, you know, um, my son's mother had to go away. So I, I, mm. I, I couldn't leave him alone. So I had to do oh. it. So I was, you know, um, a little bit nervous about it. I mean, I was also excited because I hadn't seen him in the flesh for nearly three months. So, oh. uh, so but um, yeah, I mean, it's just you get a lot of questions in your mind. You know, you, you um, what I wonder whether it's safe. It, it seems kind of crazy that everyone's walking around, but maybe it's that uh, it's under control enough here that, to allow that. But then also, I'm, I'm aware that, like, um, you know, I live in an apartment block in Paris and so um, I've had a few kind of suspicious looks I haven't been out of the house a lot because obviously people might think well what are you doing you might be bringing the disease from the UK mm -hmm. it's a weird feeling to think uh, that you're kind of maybe seen I might be I mean I hope I'm not but um, so yeah I've seen some people look at me a little dubiously uh, I've only been going out to do shopping and I wear a mask and everything and, and, and try and limit my interactions. But it's uh, it, it's strange, you know, to have those, everybody's dealing with that, the fact that um, normal social interactions aren't normal anymore because you have to right. kind of think twice before entering into them. And, and, and really, like you say, it becomes, when the message was just, hey, it's a lockdown, don't go out. That's a very simple message. It may be a bit of a pain, but, right. uh, but it's really simple. You know, you just don't go out. But then now it's like, well, okay, go out if you feel like you have to, or go out if you think you're safe. You know, it, it becomes a personal choice now of how much you're willing to gamble, I guess, or how much you're willing to risk, or what something means to you. Is it worth the risk to go and do it? So it becomes a bit more complicated. Yeah, and I, I was wondering what that adjustment was like to then be back as, like, be back with your son in that situation, because I can imagine that he probably had school cancelled, and now it's summer, so he probably isn't in school, but that must have been really bizarre as well, to go from being alone to then taking care of your son in this situation. Yeah, I mean, and and he's he's... Uh, been dealing with it in, in a much more intense way. You know, whilst I was there looking at the frolicking lambs, he was, because uh, the, the apartment that he was in with his mother what, was, uh, th there was no kind of shared courtyard or balcony or anything. So they really were stuck inside. Oh my goodness. Long time, you know, and, and the school thing is weird. Yeah, because I mean, he, he does seem to be doing lessons online, but uh, obviously that's a different experience. It, my son is 17, so I feel that that's, that's an, a generation all over the world that must be really having a lot of conflicting feelings about this whole situation because it's generally, it's generally a, th a thing that doesn't affect young people as, as strongly as, right. as people. I mean, there have been cases, but very, very few. And especially when you're that age, when you really you're like on the launch pad of life, aren't you? Like you want to go out and start living your life. Yeah. You. And then suddenly it's like, oh no, you've got to kind of stay here, stay on the launch pad for the next uh, two years or whatever. It's a, that must be a very, I can't imagine how that feels, you know. Yeah. I've got, I've, I've had a life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still having one, but you know, I've got, a, and I can get on with things and, you know, and stuff like that but when you really want to start going out and making your mark and do all those things that you've kind of thought about doing then it must be very very frustrating not to be able to do it yeah and to have in a way kind of the responsibility of caring for others because like you said like it does affect young people but not it seems as dramatically as older people and I remember I saw a post on the artist um quite a while ago on the artist Billie Eilish's page where she had said that she understood that it was selfish to go out right now and it was selfish to be around people because of the risk to others, like not the risk to her, but that she might accidentally be a risk to other people. And I'm trying to imagine being 17 and internalizing that <laughs> and having that at odds with 
my desire to go out and my desire to go explore, but be like, oh, I could accidentally be a risk to other people um, simply by leaving the house. And I was like, that is a lot to put on, you know, a 17, 18 year old mind. It certainly is. Right. Uh, anyway, you must know that we've been talking about it because it's just come back in the flat. <laughs> Hello, Mini Jarvis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've been talking about you. <laughs> um, no, that, that was him. It wasn't me. <laughs> He's gone to his room now. He's like, ah, oh, yes, my dad is back doing shenanigans. Well, and that must be also a huge change of pace to be sharing space again, because like, I don't, you know, I don't want to speak for you, obviously, but I know like when I'm working on anything creative, I need a bit of space. And I can imagine same thing when you're a teenager, you want space to roam. And now both of you are in a flat in Paris. Yeah, that's okay, though. He's got his room and, and I just, I, I hog the living room. Ah, gotcha. So it's kind of okay. I guess. It was interesting at the beginning of the lockdown, I was talking to artists about the pressures that people were feeling to create. And I think that that's dissipated a bit as this has gone on, which I, at least I think is a good thing. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, it's, um, I mean, I, I felt that as well. It's like, I don't know if it's like you have to create, but in some ways make, contact and I suppose if you're an artist the way you make contact with people maybe what makes you choose that career is that you 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 make contact through what you create mm -hmm. and, uh, and so yeah I, I must admit that like everybody I suppose at first you, you've got like a period of adjustment and then well like for instance the first thing that I thought I could do was I, I noticed that I wasn't sleeping very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought, uh, so, and I, when, when I have trouble sleeping, I usually will listen to the radio or, you know, like I have to hear a human voice basically is what I want to hear. Mm, gotcha. And so I had like a stockpile of stories that I had told uh, when I was doing a, my radio show for the BBC. Jarvis mm -hmm. Cox Sunday service. I used to tell stories on there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a bit of a stockpile of those. So I thought, well, maybe that would be kind of um, something I could just put a, a bedtime story up every week and that might help people fall asleep because uh, I, I do have one of those voices that can make people fall asleep. I've noticed it. <laughs> Often, you know, like even when I'm out at dinner or something, maybe someone will just fall asleep in the middle of the meal. Um, <laughs> so I don't take it as an insult. Uh, but yeah, I, I've always enjoyed that. You know, I, I like to read stories aloud and I like to have stories read aloud to me. And I think, I do think it's, it is that thing of having another human voice there, which yeah. makes you not alone. It's because insomnia, the thing that makes insomnia really difficult is it, it's usually the dead of night and you get those thoughts going, and then if you're not careful, it, it becomes this kind of vicious circle, mm -hmm. and you kind of mm -hmm. can't do it then. So right. anything, anything that can get you out of that vicious cycle, I think, can help. So that was one of the first things that I started doing. And then the other side of the coin was, was were these domestic discos that I did for a while, which were um, just me playing records in, in my living room with my partner mm -hmm. Kim, and, and just having a dance. <laughs> I, I, found, I found a, a laser that was kind of semi-working. <laughs> the shed and I put that on and, and I thought, you know, and similarly that was the thing I thought I was getting something out of it because I was playing music I liked and occasionally I would get up and have a dance. And I think dancing, apart from, you need exercise when you're on lockdown. It also, if you get into dancing to music, you can switch your brain off for a bit. And I think that yeah. was really important because, you know, you can think of so many different nightmare scenarios and there's such a lot of information. You, you just have to switch off occasionally. And right. dancing, you know, I've always liked dancing for that, that you can just, 
you know, I'm a person who lives in, in my head a lot because that's what you do if you're trying to think up ideas for songs or you're trying to think up words for songs or whatever. So mm -hmm. that opportunity to escape into the body and just latch onto the rhythm of the song and just go with it and, and kind of, it's a kind of meditative thing to do. So, um, so I was doing it for myself, but also I thought it was, uh, it would be good for, you know, I, I think other people were feeling that same thing. So I thought it would be good to share it with that. I think also maybe because I should have been on tour at that point. We, yes. The, the Jarvis record was supposed to come out at the beginning of May. So I think I'd kind of built myself up to the fact that, yes, I'm going to be out performing to people. And then, of course, I wasn't. Um, and doing it on Instagram Live, I'm not sponsored by them. But <laughs> the thing with that is that, you know, people can make comments as you're doing it and you can yes. respond to them. And yes. also people watching can talk to each other. And so it, it was the nearest thing I could find to a live, a, an actual live experience, you know, where it felt, you felt that thing of it happening in real time. It wasn't just, you know, I saw, I did watch a few things where people would play a song from the living room and that was, that was quite nice, but they were usually pre-recorded. So you mm -hmm. didn't get the feeling of a moment that people could be sharing it at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I it's just probably just as important for the audience to be sharing it and talking to each other as it is for the artist or performer to know that it's happening in real time as well. Well, yeah, because in that case, then it's like an energetic exchange. If you're recording something, I mean, that is one thing, um, but it's a very separate thing than being able to perform because when you're performing on stage, obviously you can't necessarily see what the other people are saying, but you feel their energy, whereas on Instagram Live or on Twitch or something like that, you do have that exchange because it's not just you making something and then giving it to someone and having that like disconnect it's like you're connecting with one another and I was like oh that that checks out <laughs> like, yeah, and, and the, the comments you know people will let you know if they like a song or not yeah uh, <laughs> stuff like that you know and you, you can even look at how many numbers of people are watching and then if it starts to go down you can panic uh, or, <laughs> So yeah, it, 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 you get that feeling of an audience of, of, of which, which, you know, as a performer is really important because that's the point of doing a, a performance is, is that you've somehow latch onto the energy. There's, there's a back and forth between you and an audience. And, yeah. and it's something that, you know, this record that, that we've just done is something that I'm really pleased with with that because that was kind of recorded in that way, as in um, quite a few of the songs, the, the initial recordings are taken from live shows. And mm -hmm. you know, we've been working on the songs out in the field, so to speak, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then checking the recordings and stuff. And so uh, it's like, you know, that method of, of making a record is not possible now. You know, it, 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 and nobody really knows when live shows are gonna be as they were right you know, that, uh, that seems to be like the holy grail at the moment in the music industry is people trying to work out how do we get back to live performance and stuff like that and um, and so the fact that we did it kind of in collaboration with an audience really up close and personal with people yeah uh, I'm, I'm just really i'm really pleased that, that that we were able to do that i was gonna say i'm glad that you were able to capture that because i think that as you just said, like in a way that's a bit on pause. Like I, I do think that at some point in the future we'll, we will all be able to congregate together again, but we can't for a while at least. Um, but the fact that you were able to capture that energy because there is something just, I don't even have a word for it, but like that, that feeling when you're at a show or that feeling when you know that the audience is with you, or like you said, when people start leaving and they panic and you're like, Oh, Oh no, I, I need to reread the room. <laughs> <laughs> and especially in this case where where the songs weren't completely formed i mean they weren't like improvised jams or anything but but the length of different sections and stuff like that weren't completely worked out so that was like that was like you know the form was was a reaction to the audience was was like uh, it, it felt like it happened naturally rather than mapping it out you know yeah 
it's the opposite of making music on a computer because when you make music on a computer you're always working to some grid so it's always mathematical like you do that for two times do that for four times do that for eight times then do that for two times again you know it always becomes right. this kind of very strict like lego whereas this, yeah. was more, this was more like a tree this was like you know just the the why does the tree assume a particular shape no one can really say why but you can recognize it as a tree and you know when a tree looks beautiful you know but uh, it's not really kind of constructed uh, right. and and so yeah i hope that something similar happened that it ended up having a natural kind of shape that was yeah i don't want to say organic but i will say it organic <laughs> Shout it from the rooftops. And I think that in a way there's value to both of those. Like for whatever reason, my brain was trying to amalgamate a natural tree and Legos. And all I came up with was those strange cell phone towers that they tried to inelegantly disguise as trees. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm really glad you brought those up because there's, there's one of those. I keep meaning to take a picture of it. There's um, where, the place I was telling you about where all the baby lambs were. Yeah. It's this, as you drive towards Sheffield from there, on the way in, there, there's one of those things you just described. It's like a, an attempt at a tree. <laughs> it's, it's disguising uh, a, a phone mast or something. Yes. It's such it's a... One of those, um, you know, those really bad artificial Christmas trees that you get? Just like that. <laughs> yes. um, and then you realise how... Um, how great real trees are and how you can totally tell straight away when that, that that isn't a tree and it's just like a really kind of it's not even like a kid's idea of a tree it's just no. like a <laughs> really bad impersonation of a tree and it kind of just it makes me it makes me want to be like just put a cell tower there like just be what you are if you're a cell tower just be a cell tower if you're a tree be a tree when you were talking about the way that your music kind of spread out like a tree, I was wondering, do you feel that you capture any of that when you are recording? Because yes, like it is to a grid. Yes, when you are working in something, you know, on anything on your computer, you can quantize it within an inch of its life. But do you think that you capture any of that live energy when you are then tracking? Or do you feel like there's there's something qualitatively different? Yeah, I think for me, it, it was... That was the thing that the spark that brought this whole thing to life because um, some of the songs on the record, I, I did start working on them like not that long after the last record, Further Complications, which is, you know, 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think there's there's a song on there called Am I Missing Something? And I think we started work on that like eight years ago, which is really embarrassing. Um, <laughs> and And I was kind of... You know, I was doing other things. Uh, um, I, I did the radio show and stuff like that. I, I, um, but always in the back of my mind, I, I was thinking I've got to get on with some writing some songs. And, and I was always working on songs a little bit, but they never really convinced me. They never really felt alive. Mm. Uh, and it was just... What, what happened really was I got invited to to do this uh, festival that Sigur Ross put together in at the, right at the end of 2017. It was in between Christmas and New Year, and it was mm -hmm. a festival in this uh, crazy modern opera house on the harbour in Reykjavik. Oh, um, was it at Harper? Yeah, so, yeah. So I thought, well, that's, I really love Iceland, and I like those guys, and, I, and that's an interesting building. So I thought, oh, I'd really like to do it, but all the... I'd just done the Room 29 album, but Chili Gonzalez was doing his own show in Germany and everybody else who I normally would work with was busy. And so mm -hmm. I was going to say no. And then I thought, no, I, I, maybe this is, I, I just said yes. <laughs> that, that, that was just the key because then I, if I, I had to get a band together um, and as soon as I did that, uh, you know, I only had like two months to do it. I, I, I got in touch with Serafina, uh, Serafina, I'd, I'd produced a record for her and I, and I really liked her music and she brought Emma with her because they'd been playing in a band together. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the rhythm section, Adam and Andrew, I'd played at a Scott Walker prom. They were the rhythm section there and I was impressed by them. So I just got that band together. And then as soon as I showed them these kind of half ideas for songs, as soon as they started playing on them, then they instantly got more alive because I couldn't be in control of it anymore. You know, I wasn't just like looking, I wasn't looking at a cursor on a screen. Right. And I like, I couldn't press a space bar and make them all stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so and I mean, and it's ridiculous really, because obviously my roots as a musician is being in a band, you know, that's how I started. I got together a band when I was like 14 and still at school that. and that was my dream you know we did it the real old-fashioned way of just getting friends around to my mother's living room on a Friday night when she was out and just making some noise and waited until that noise started to kind of somehow slightly resemble a song <laughs> and, and so really I, you know that it was like coming back to the beginning for me and I, and I felt silly for not having realized sooner that that was the way to count you know that was the way to do it so really it, it, this story of this record really has been the fact that the more people got involved the more it got the better it got so first just getting the band together improved it mm -hmm. then that we had to play it for an audience also improved it and each time we played the songs they improved and I would try different things out in the heat of the moment or sometimes it might even be a mistake or something Right. And and also, you know, um, Serafina and Emma come from a more kind of, there's a lot more kind of improvisation in their background. So they were into that, just making things up in the heat of the moment. And, uh, and, uh, and it just kind of, it was like Frankenstein's monster finally <laughs> started out some life. And, uh, and that was great. You know, that was good. Then he, that's great when you don't feel totally in control of it anymore and it, and it seems to be getting a life of its own. That's kind of what you always hope for when you, when you make something, you know, because that's a great feeling when, it, when, it, when you don't feel like uh, it's just an idea that you had, when you think it's like something that you, you set it in motion but then you just follow it to where it, wherever it goes. Well, and it sounds a bit like you described dancing, that it's a mixture of like, in a way, you do have to be in your head a bit to try and capture that idea, but then you have to let go and just kind of let it take you somewhere. And it sounds yeah. like, way, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good comparison because when you start dancing, you're always a bit self-conscious, aren't you? You kind of yeah. think, how do people dance? Oh, should I move my arm now? Or is it... <laughs> Are people watching me? Am I going to look silly? You know, all this kind of stuff goes through your head. And then if you stick with it, maybe after like three, four minutes, your brain sh shuts up and then yep. you just into it. And then it's fun and, and you don't have to think about it. You know, it's like some other part of you takes over. And it's funny to me that you said that you, you had felt like ashamed that those songs were waiting for those eight years, but one, it, it sounds like you created a lot of other things during that time. And two, it sounds like they were waiting until Yancy was like, okay, we're going to Harpa. Are you coming with us? Um, it sounds like they were just waiting there until the right time. I was like, that's actually really wonderful that you didn't try to push them too soon or that you didn't try to do something that felt inauthentic. It's like you actually did wait until they started taking you away. I was like, that's actually really cool. Well, I hope so. I mean, I just wish it didn't take so long because... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting any younger and I would like to, to to keep making records. I mean, I hope, I mean, that's another frustrating thing about not being able to go on tour at the moment because apart from just wanting to get out and play the stuff to people, I wanted to keep this process going. So yeah. we, we were going to put a couple of new songs in the set and, and work on them in the same way. Because um, I, I do feel like, Having made this kind of a breakthrough, I, I don't. I, I would just like to see it through. You know, keep going. I don't want to wait another ten years to make a record, basically, because right. Uh, why, you know? So <laughs> having, having done that, um, I hope. Yeah, I hope we can keep the momentum of this going because it's a, it's a, it's a fun way to to make music. Well, the domestic discos do sound like 
a good way to interface with people and it, it popped in my brain. I was like, I wonder if it would be possible to play live with songs that you're kind of workshopping in that way on something like that's streaming so that you can get people's feedback or if it wouldn't have quite the same effect as playing it live in person. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're trying to look at that. I mean, I guess everybody, like I say, in the, in the music industry is trying to think of ways of playing. Um, you know, there's people trying to play online. I think that like Laura Marling is doing a show uh, in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. So it's like a show that people buy tickets for and then watch it. On yeah. The but it's in, I think, she, I think she's doing it in the Union Chapel in London, Ooh. which is a really nice place. Oh, beautiful place. I think, yeah, Sleaford Mods are going to do something on the 20th of June. That they're, they're in the hun in the 100 Club, just on Oxford Street. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, similarly, you know, you buy a ticket and you then you can watch it. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what they're like, because obviously it's not going to feel like a concert, but maybe there's a way of doing something that does feel like um, authentic. I mean, the other thing I've heard of is... I think in Denmark, they had some drive-in concerts. Or, or yeah, I saw, I saw the footage of that. And I, I was so curious as to what that might feel like. Because I know like at, at old like drive-in movies, they would give you that little speaker thing in your car. You would, you know, tune in on your radio. But I was like, what, you know, what's it like through those stages of remove? And like, what's the sound quality like? And like, cause there's, there's nothing that replaces when you actually feel like live sound, like from a big sound system and you can feel it reverberating through you. And I'm like, yeah. what, what would that be like? <laughs> I'm curious. I, well, I, don't know. I, I was wondering what it'd be like as a performer as well. Like, you know, at the end of the song, instead of people clapping, they'll beat the horns. <laughs> <laughs> or, or they flash their headlights. They flash their headlights at you. <laughs> it would be a pretty weird uh, feeling. That would be kind of mental. <laughs> that would be like a flock of weird car geese. Yeah, I, I mean, and it's it's not a pleasant sound. A lot of car horns all going off at the same time. You know? No, no, it's really, <laughs> it's really not when I think about it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I was curious when you talked about the stories, where you got, where you got the stories that you read and what those stories were. Well, they were a mixture really. Um, just stuff that I'd, read that I liked some some were kind of like folk tales and things I've always liked those I, I like folk tales because you know they're like stories that you can't say who who wrote them so they, they kind of say something about um the kind of roots of what humans like are from stories uh, and sometimes it's, the plot lines of those things are really crazy so uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> I read a couple of those but then I started off with a Richard Brautigan story mm -hmm. um, called Times Square in Montana, which was basically revolves around him replacing light bulbs in his barn. That sounds very Richard Brautigan. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, just stuff that I, you know, I, I usually make, you know, I do read a lot and I, and I make notes of things. And like I say, I, I'd, I'd thought of stuff that I could read on the, the Sunday service radio program because that, for people who don't know that program, it was on UK radio, and it was it was between four pm and six pm on a Sunday afternoon, which is usually a kind of dead zone, I think. Uh, as mm -hmm. in, uh, if you've been out the night before, you'll probably just be lying on the settee recovering or something. <laughs> yeah, at that point, you're semi-conscious. Yeah, and it's like you know the the. The week is almost over, but not quite over. The new week hasn't started. So it's this kind of weird limbo time. And I thought that I just tried to play very low energy music and 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 tell stories, sometimes have poetry, sometimes interview people and just have stuff that, that was really slow. And maybe, you know, it would just drift through the consciousness of somebody semi-conscious on a, on a sofa or, or, or something like that. Because that's the time when 
that's a time when ideas or thoughts can go in. You know, it, it's you're not thinking about um, too much about what you've got to do the next day. You, you're a bit receptive to things, and and um, so I. I it was like I, I wasn't really trying to send people to sleep, but I was trying to keep things mellow. Mm. I remember I used to do that, you know, when in the bad old days when I used to, you know, drink a lot and get kind of wasted on a Saturday uh -huh. night. Um, I always appreciated that. I used to listen to this kind of easy listening radio show uh, on a Sunday to try and kind of calm myself, you know, mm. keep, keep the horror at bay. And so I always, I, I kind of felt like I wanted to um, make something that, that performed that same function for other people. Well, and the value of gathering around storytelling, I was wondering which systems of folk tales you went with, like if there were any cultures in particular that spoke to you and which well, ones made it. I, I, I bought a couple of books of Icelandic folk tales when I was over there. There's some good ones there. The Grimm, you know, the Grimm stories are good. And then there's this writer called Alan Garner who writes his own books. He's really old now, he's in his 90s, but he also uh, did some retellings of folk tales. And I read two of his, because uh, there's one called Faithful John and one called The Trade That No One Knows. And they're really, they're really good stories. They've got such crazy details in them. Um, uh, I, I kind of like that, you know. Um, there's a darkness to them. You know, I mean, I think folk tales were often used as a way of, um, you know, they're not just for kids, for sure. They're like a way of giving ideas about how the world works to, to people and, and uh, preparing yeah. them for certain things, you know. And, and, and they give you an insight into fantasy, uh, yes. the fantasy aspect of, of humans as well so uh, I, I do like them and you know it, uh, I'm going to actually wrap that up I think this next Sunday is going to be the last one and I'm going to read uh, a Lydia Davis story hmm. the reason I'm doing that is because the last time I was in the States was was uh, not that long ago actually in February I was over doing some kind of promotional work for this record. And I had a conversation with that guy, Stephen Merritt from the Magnetic Fields. Oh yeah. That was a podcast that was put out. And during that conversation, we were talking about writers that we liked. And he said, have you read Lydia Davis? And I, I hadn't even heard of her. So he very kindly, at the right at the beginning of lockdown, he sent me some books of hers. Oh. York, and, um, so I, I was reading through her collected short stories and there's this one particular story called Break It Down, which is it's kind of like this guy trying to break down how much this relationship has cost him in money. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it, that was a first, there's lots of great stories in this collection, but that was the first one that really uh, grabbed me. So I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to do a reading of that and I think that will be the the last one and I, I sent some books to Stephen in return but I, I, I well I hope that they've reached there I, I, haven't, I haven't found out whether they got to him actually. Now I'm curious about two things I was like one why is it the last one I guess three things Spanish Inquisition of Curiosity two now I really want to read Lydia Davis and then I was like three which books did you send him and I was like what books would you recommend? Uh, I just tried to send him some books that that I'd enjoyed. So most of them were short stories. There was a, hmm, now let me try and remember. Okay, so there was a, there was a Graham Greene book of short stories called A Sense of Reality. Really that's just because the first story in that collection is called Under the Garden. And mm -hmm. I would recommend that for anyone to read. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an anomaly for Graham Greene it, because it's kind of like a fantasy story. Um, mm. It's very strange, very dreamlike. Um, and really, you know, sometimes the way that you'll read something and then it will really hang around with you um, for afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so I sent that. I, uh, there was a collection, you know, the poet Ted Hughes. Mm -hmm. 
he also wrote some short stories and I sent a collection of those. There was one particular story there called The Rain Horse, which is about a guy who was kind of, I guess he was born in the countryside, but then has lived in a city for a long time. He's going back and he, he kind of stops and decides he's going to go and walk through a field and halfway through that, suddenly he gets attacked by a horse. Oh my God. <laughs> I won't go any further than that, uh, but I remember reading that when I was at school, when I was like 13, and it really, again, it really it's kind of uh, you. with me. So, so yeah, I just tried to send in some books with with things that had that had uh, meant something to me, and uh, and maybe that he wouldn't have have read. So uh, I must check whether he's got them and whether he enjoyed them. I always quite like giving people books that I've enjoyed and seeing what they look like through their eyes because they're going to have a totally different experience than I had with the book. And so I, I really like that. It's like playing one of your favorite songs for someone and just watching them, being like, hmm? It is, but then, think of it? but then it's terrible if they turn around and say, well, I didn't really like it. What are you going to go? <laughs> you know, just go, what ends? Uh, yeah. well, like, it's, it's the same as like when you show somebody one of your favorite movies as well. Yes. As well. Yes. And that's that's actually worse because if you use it's like, you know, you'll be sat next to the person and you, you can you can just tell they don't really have to say anything, but you can just tell whether they're enjoying it or not. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Or when they're trying to placate you by being like, "No, no, it's really I. I really like Twin Peaks. No, I, I really dig it." And you're like, "No, I, I really, I don't think you do." <laughs> yeah. <gasps> and why? I guess why is it the last one? Um. Well, it's not like lockdown is over, but it's like I say, it's it's moving into a different stage now and, and I think that's why I stopped the domestic disco as well it was like um whilst we were all in the same I mean I think that was what was interesting about lockdown and, and when I say that I don't want to kind of appear crass like saying lockdown was a good thing because obviously it wasn't because it was it was made necessary because loads of people were dying so there's good about that but the one thing that was interesting about it was this this thing that everybody was in the same situation everybody was confined right so like a, it was like a global pause and as that's never happened in my lifetime and you know everyone had a chance to reevaluate or to reprioritize things within their life right uh, and and everybody could feel like they were going through the same kind of emotions of having their life interrupted Right. So, so then, as you know, so then it came down to fundamental things like you need a story to help you sleep, you need something to make you dance. It was, and now, like I say, I think now different countries are coming out of it at different speeds. Uh, it becomes now more a choice of of how much you decide to confine yourself or not. And so, I. It's not like, yeah, I just feel like it's, uh, if I carried on with it, it would be more like a, I hope that when I did them, they were kind of useful in some way. Like mm -hmm. I say, I got something out of them as well, but it wasn't like uh, a normal performance where. Right. Uh, it would seem a bit too ego driven, I think, if I just carried on with it. Plus I have actually run out of stories that uh, <laughs> I've already recorded. <laughs> But that's that's the more prosaic uh, uh, reason for it. I mean, the the Lydia Davis one that I mentioned, I will. That's the, that'll be the only one that I've recorded from scratch, especially wow. for this thing. Well, and it, it sounds like you kind of spoke to how it became a collective experience when we were on lockdown, but now in a way, it's like a fractured experience, and it's it's much like reading the room in a performance that you're like, well, I don't know if that's really what people need anymore right now. Um, because well, yeah. and also, yeah, it's that's a big thing about you know performances. I mean, most concerts that I go to, I think, are too long, <laughs> and that's not like I don't like them, but it's just like, like um, you know, you can really ruin things by just going on too long. I mean, the most 
disappointing concert that I've been to in the last few years was, uh, you know, Soft Cell did a special um, farewell show mm -hmm. at the Two, which is a horrible venue in London. So that wasn't a good start. It's a giant, uh, just a horrible, big, massive venue thing. Right, um, right. Um, but, you know, they start... The thing was, people were so excited. I... I, I, I spoke to so many people in the queue who were like like really emotional and obviously soft cell music had meant so much to them yeah uh, well this you know this this is all set up to be something amazing and then they came on stage and they would play the first song they played was this song memorabilia which is a great song mm -hmm. and i thought this is going to be this is going to be mind-blowing this is going to be such a great thing there's such a good atmosphere which i never thought would be possible in the o2 <laughs> Um, and then they just kind of threw it away because they just played so many kind of obscure songs and huh. and even kind of just really bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in the end, I, I, after like after like about nearly two hours, um, this. You know, they still hadn't, hadn't played uh, Tainted Love. And I, and I was, I just, I couldn't take any more. Uh, I think I was in a, kind of a sensitive mood because I was just about to come over and play on the West Coast. You know, uh, we played some shows back in 2018 mm -hmm. up, up the West Coast of, of America. We played at... In LA, we played at the Regent Theatre. Oh, anyway, that's a wonderful theatre. So we were, we were just building up to that. So maybe I was a bit, but it, it was an example of kind of throwing away all this goodwill. And mm. they just have played, if they just have truncated it and played for like an hour and a half, it would have been fantastic. They it just, I don't know, less is more sometimes. It's like when you're writing an essay in school and you want it to, you know, meet the word limit, but there's also value in being concise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember that writing lesson of just, okay, if you hit the word limit and you've said what you need to say, you're good. <laughs> like, <gasps> now I'm wondering what your favorite Icelandic folktale is because they really do have some lovely ones. Um. There's one called the Wizards of the Westman Islands, and it's. I was going to put that one on, but I thought it was a bit too much because it's all set during the time of the Black Death. <laughs> so um, a bit on the nose. Yeah, a little bit too much, you know, because like it's like this guy, this guy uh, survives it, but he's about the only person who does survive it. And then now, what is it? Yeah, these. These wizards have, have survived it because they live on the Westman Islands, which are some little volcanic islands just off the coast of, of Iceland. And then, uh, no, no, that's it. The guy is a wizard himself. That's it. The guy is a wizard. He's sent to the mainland to see if anybody's left alive. Mm. And, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, he kind of meets this woman who is still alive and he falls in love with her. And so he doesn't go back to the wizards to report so then they send this curse to kill him but he he outwits the curse and i remember there's just some part, part of it where he somehow he, he manages to turn this fearsome curse into a fly and then he coaxes it into a hollow bone and then puts a cork in the end to keep it prisoner little details like that i like you see it seems, like, it seems like very specific, like it really did happen, but obviously it probably didn't happen. That but. is, that's so particular. And have mm. you been to a, to Yancey and his sister's shop in Reykjavik? Have you been to Fisher? No, I didn't get a chance. I, he told me about it, but like I say, when we were there, because it was between um, Christmas and New Year, everything was shut basically. Oh, the, it reminded me of some of the descriptions of some of the folk remedies that they have. Um, they're, they're the same, where it's, it's so incredibly specific. 
And that's one thing that really struck me of uh, because they have like the different perfumes that they've made and the natural products for like shampoo and all, you know, they're really beautiful, by the way, the shop itself is amazing. Um, but they had the descriptions of like traditional folk remedies and they're that level of specificity. And I loved that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I think a lot of that must be to do with, you know, the fact that Iceland is in darkness half the year. And, and I guess, you know, going back years and years and years, people have had to um, entertain themselves. And I think that also explains all this thing, you know, the, the, the belief in trolls and things like that, that it's, it's always been a very sparsely populated place as well. So I think part of it is believing in, in the supernatural wizards and, and, other, and beings that are living in another dimension will stop you from feel, feeling so lonely, basically. You know, you, it's like that it's like there is, there are other people around, but you just can't see them because they're, they're in a different dimension. My brain just <laughs> somehow crossed all the myths of like the other folk and the other people, like the elf folk that live, like you said, in the other dimension with kind of how we were in lockdown where we were alone, but we knew that people were there, but they weren't yeah. there, there. <laughs> yeah. it, was the, it was the idea of them, wasn't it? But we knew, yeah, we, we had faith that they were there. And yeah, yeah I mean, it's like this, it's the difference between... I, I was like everybody else, you know, I hadn't heard of Zoom before lockdown and then suddenly most of my socialization as, as socializing, yes, as, as taken. <laughs> so, um, so I saw my family, I managed to, I was able to converse with them, but uh, it, it really isn't the same as when you actually with someone. Uh, it's more like a cipher or a, or a yeah and and uh, yeah you you're carrying along the idea of that person but um yeah i've not thought about that before you you're right with the, the the iceland thing we all we all were had an insight into that mindset i suppose of uh, of conjuring these people up to stop us from feeling lonely yeah yeah, I hadn't thought of that until that very moment and was like, hmm, yeah, because that there's something palpable about when you're in the same space with people, like when you were talking about what would it be like to perform to a group of cars, where even though cognitively you know that there's people in the cars, it's like you can't really have that same energetic exchange. And I feel really lucky that um, towards the beginning of this in early March, my friends that I co-work with, like I was telling you about like Lori and two of our other friends, um, that we kind of banded together as like a pod that we were like, okay, we're going to be the only people that we can see and we can see each other in our homes and that's it um, mm -hmm. to kind of control that we were essentially quarantined, but we were quarantined together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that that did in a, in a big way kind of help us during lockdown because otherwise it's like, I live alone. Otherwise I would have just been alone the whole time. And just simply conjuring people the whole time. But at the very least, I did have like my pod mates. <laughs> that, that's very weird to rely upon. I mean, it, it, in total, it's just four people. And it's very strange for months on end to rely all of your social interactions on, you know, three other people. It's very weird. Well, yeah. I mean, I suppose the danger is if you fall out with them. <laughs> <laughs> oh it was trust me there was like a band drama of the week it was <laughs> like <laughs> i'm sure it was like you know it was like being on tour in the same place where like someone was always annoying someone else but we all love one another <laughs> so <laughs> yeah well, I, I, I mean that you know because I, I don't live with my partner kim full time because sometimes i'm over here in paris and and, and stuff like that. So, so you know, this the fact that we were together for nearly three months uh, um, alone, really, no one else. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't kill each other, so that's uh, really good. I was going to say, you're talking to me now, which leads me to believe that you're alive. Yeah. 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 No, it's very, it could put a lot of pressure on people. Like, I did think of the idea of being alone the whole time because... I do need lots of space, but I think it really did do me good to be able to go to my friend's home um, 
and to see people and remind myself of people as opposed to, I like what you said about like ciphers of people. Um, it is valuable. Um, but yeah, when you are kind of all up in someone's business, like the tiniest things will annoy you no matter how much you love that person. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, I think that's, again, you know, looking for the silver lining in, the, in this situation um, is that, you know, our modern society had been moving more to atomization of people interacting through the, the intermediary of a screen or, you know, so, and not really going out so much, you know, you would you would watch a movie on your computer rather than going to a cinema. You would maybe mm. put the food in instead of going to a restaurant and and talk to your friends on on Skype or whatever. And then suddenly, when 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 you weren't allowed access to those normal physical in, in, uh, interactions, then everybody realised how fundamentally important they were. And I think that that's a, a positive thing, you know, and that to realise that the pleasure in life comes from other people. Yeah, and even even ambiently being around other people, like one of the things that I've missed the most is taking a book to one of, there's like several cafes that I frequent. And of course, like, you know, I, I had thought it was just that it was the change of environment, but I realized I was finally able to go to one of my local cafes and the barista that's usually working there was actually working at the window. And though we were both like masked and gloved, obviously we recognized one another and he got so excited and I got so excited. And even though I didn't, you know, I couldn't like sit at the cafe and read, I realized I was like, part of why I like being here is the people. And it seemed like such a idiotic thing to have it just strike me. <laughs> it wasn't simply that I, you know, really liked their chairs or something. Um, but it was even being around other people and reading around other people, writing around other people, having the interactions I do with the person that, you know, that works there that I've become familiar with. And like, you know, that that was the valuable thing to me. And so now whenever I can, I walk up to my local cafe uh, so that I can just order from afar and wave <laughs> um, to get that little bit. And I, I think that you're right. That's incredibly valuable. And I think that, that that got a bit lost probably in the last decade or so. Yeah, so so that's, that's a good kind of reset thing to have happened, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, I feel in a way that some people are a bit like house cats where it's like they meow at the door. But then when you open the door, they look at you like, why'd you open the door? It's not like I wanted to go outside. Um, but now we're all that house cat. And I'm just like, I wonder if we all are just going to bolt outside at this point. Yeah, I, I said that that's, I mean, that's why, um, I mean, I'm, I'm getting used to it now. But, I, you know, we're, we're only on Thursday now. I've only been in the, this city environment for two days and um, I haven't been going out that much. I mean, partly for the reasons that we talked about earlier, that trying to be responsible because I could be trailing something along with me or whatever, but also, um, yeah, I, I guess I got used to being a lot of the time in my own company, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and just kind of getting on with little bits of of work and stuff like that. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I'll have to see. I, I might have to call some Parisian friends and see if there's anything such, if there is such a thing as a socially distanced thing, you know, social event this uh, weekend. That would be interesting to see. Yeah. And some of the, I hadn't expected this, but in a way like socially distanced social time feels extraordinarily odd. They had reopened the hiking trails and one of my pod mates and I went for a hike and on our way back down the trail, we actually saw one of his best friends um, who we're not quarantined with. Um, and she wasn't wearing a mask and just naturally started running towards us because she hadn't seen her friend in months. And like, I, I know her as well, though obviously not as well as he. And I had to, I grabbed his hand. I was like, wait, no. Because <laughs> um, normally I would have embraced her as well. Um, but I was like, no, wait, no, we have to, we have to keep distance because she's in a different household. 
Um, and so we kind of, we were standing outside, like, like circling around each other in a way. And it, it, you know, in some ways it was good to see her, but in other ways it was so very strange to not be able to like embrace our friend. And afterwards, when we were walking towards my car, he started really welling up with tears and said that it was actually harder to see her in person and not be able to hug her as opposed to seeing her on FaceTime. Um, and he's like, I don't know if that just made it worse. Um, because he's like, it was so stilted compared to how we normally interact. Um, and I hadn't anticipated that. Like it was something that I genuinely, like I hadn't thought of because at first I was like, oh, well, wouldn't, wouldn't it be more joyful to see someone? But then I was like, wait, if you can't interact with them the way that you normally do that, that might just highlight how weird everything is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I might, I might get insight into that because I've got a dear friend here and she's, She's got her birthday on Monday. So, you know, normally I would go out for a drink with her or she, she normally has a party or something. So I don't know if she's planning on doing anything, but that, that might be like that, you know, that um, it would feel weird not to be able to kind of celebrate in a, in a kind of relaxed way. Yeah. We'll I don't know. I'm just going to put some rubber gloves on and, and maybe, I, you know, and just <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah I like that uh one of my friends has been doing socially distanced dinners where she'll cook something um and people will bring their utensils so that they can eat the food like out in the yard and she's in the house so it's like they are sort of eating together and they can converse but they're in technically like slightly different places um so they are maintaining distance but I think that there there are interesting workarounds because I think much like storytelling, like, you know, feeding people or having a drink with someone, like those are things that we like to do as humans, um, figuring out ways to do that. Yeah, I, I found myself thinking about this. Somebody once bought me this kind of joke fork. It was like a fork, you know, like a radio uh, antenna, the, the, uh -huh. the telescopic thing. <laughs> then it had a fork on the end of it. So you could kind of like, you could, you know, you could get some spaghetti from a, a, the distance of about three feet away. And I, I, I kept thinking about this fork. <laughs> you today, thinking that would be a way of like, you know, eating dinner with somebody from a social distance, but it would be really, really difficult to, it would take you ages to eat a meal. Um, you could steal one olive at a time. But it would be a lot of fun. <laughs> That's... <laughs> In conclusion, in like in the next few weeks, like, what do you think you want to do with your time? It's a very strange time to ask that, which is why I'm like, does anyone know how to anticipate what to do with their time? Um. Well, I'm, I'm trying to finish a book that I'm, I should have finished quite a long time ago. So the, I've always got that at the back of my mind. And we are trying to look into, you know, this record that we've spoken about is coming out on the 17th of July. So um, I'm, we're talking to people about whether we could, we're trying to th find ways of maybe doing something around the time that the record comes out mm. that would obviously not be like a normal concert, but maybe we can do something that would be fun to watch and would work in some way. So. I'm talking to a few different people about how we could approach that, where we could film it. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully by that time, in a couple, in a few weeks, things have loosened in the UK. As long as there's not like another spike or something, that's probably going to carry on. So we probably would be allowed to play together as a band. Right. Because um, we tried the thing. We did try to do this thing of playing live online together and that just did not work at all. Everything was out of time and it was... Oh, geez, that would be really frustrating. So we've been, we have been keeping in touch creatively by doing this kind of musical consequences game. So somebody will, one member of the band will make up a, like a little musical refrain and then send it to another member and they add something to it and then it gets passed around and we've done a couple of pieces of music that way. And I love that. Yeah, they're all right. They, 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 I don't know whether we'll ever put them out, but it's been good fun to do that, and that keeps us in touch with each other. So 
but yeah, to try and do something where we all kind of play together would be my ambition. Mm -hmm. uh, probably wouldn't be able to do it to an actual audience that were there, but if we can think of an interesting way of presenting it, then uh, that would be great. Well, it sounds like almost redefining your identity as like an artist right now, because you're like, well, how, how do I do this? <laughs> I mean, well, you just have to do it so that it feels right, you know, that it, yeah. feels, that it feels legitimate, that it feels like a proper performance doesn't feel phony or, or just like a pale imitation of something else. You, you have to try and hopefully stumble across something that is its own thing, that, that, that kind of fulfills, it ticks those same boxes, you know. Right, right. You get that energetic exchange. Right that's still a work in progress. So uh, I've got my fingers crossed, you know, that it's going to work. I, you couldn't see, I just nodded sagely. I was like, I, sh I should just tell Jarvis that I nodded. I'm like, I believe in you. I think you'll, I think you'll find it. <laughs> if you pulled everything together for Harper, I think you can do it. Uh, well, thank you. That's, uh, uh, I'm glad you've got confidence in that. <laughs> Like at least one of us has faith in that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Before lockdown, I would talk to people about, you know, what would their advice be for people who are working on multiple things? And at this point, it's just like, whoa, I've just been talking to people like we just did about, like, how do you redefine yourself in light of this? How do you redefine your art? Um, and yeah, I guess that'll be really interesting to see what comes of it in a few months and see what you choose to do. And now I'm curious to read your book. If it ever gets finished, I'll send you a copy. <laughs> uh, no, it's getting near. It is getting nearer. It is getting nearer. But um, yeah, books are a tricky thing. No, I, I'm happy with what I've got so far. It's just I, I, I kind of long ago, I suppose, I kind of resigned myself to the fact that I'm just, you know, the Eagles sang about life in the fast lane, but I, I I'm. Basically, I'm life in the slow lane. <laughs> it takes me so long to, to get to the end of something. But, you know, I thank you for your encouraging thing that you said earlier on in our conversation where I do think there is something in that, um, you know, generally speaking, we're living in a world where there's a, there's a surplus of artistic expression, maybe a surfeit of artistic expression. And... And you, you end up in this situation where you feel like you're being shouted at by from lots of different directions of people trying to get your attention. And, yeah. you know, I think it's good to try not to add to the background noise and on, only to do things when you actually think it's worthwhile. And, and yeah. so uh, that does take time. It really you know, a, lot of, a lot of it is you, as a human being, processing your your experiences and that's just that just does take time like there's a song on this latest record called swanky modes and that's all about when i was living in camden mm -hmm. towards the end of being at college in 1991 so nearly 30 years ago so why suddenly those experiences from nearly 30 years ago suddenly came to the surface of my mind and turned themselves into lyrics for a song yeah i don't know uh, but it did, and I think that's sometimes how it works. You know, you, you're not even aware that you're working on something. It's just a memory that's floated around somewhere at the back of your mind, and, and occasionally it'll just rise to the surface, and, and then it's just recognizing that and, and fishing it out before it sinks again without trace, never to be seen again. <laughs> Well, I think there's great value in that. I don't, you know, you just said something that really, I, you know, I'm trying to think of how to articulate it. Several people have touched on it of that it's okay to take time. It's okay to let things sort themselves out. It's okay to not have an immediate reaction to things. Like it's okay to kind of let your memories surprise you and let these little bits float to the surface and that that's all right. Like we don't need to do everything right this second. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think then it's, then it's a more natural process, you know, uh, it's like the way that if you're thinking of 
some problem or trying to work something out and um, and then you go to sleep and then it seems really difficult and then you wake up in the morning and you've got the answer it's like exactly. in some, your, your mind worked on it while you were asleep and that's more efficient than you sitting there really trying to concentrate you'll you know you probably won't get the answer by doing that Right. It's the, it's the getting out of your head bit by dancing or playing with your bandmates or, you know, doing something that, yes, like the thing is still there and your brain is slowly untangling it, but you don't have to necessarily focus on the untangling. Like, just, just let it take its course. Yeah, which is nice, you know, because it's like having faith in yourself in a way. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful note to end things on. I was just like, well, can't think of a better thing to say about that. That was lovely. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, I'd better uh, I'd better get on with the serving our evening meal here in Paris. I was going to say you have dad duties. They're calling to you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, especially under, you know, I, I at the beginning of this was like such strange circumstance. And now I'm like, nope, only get stranger. I mean, this year we've had like. Yeah, I know it is. And it's not even halfway done yet this year. So, yeah. Anyway. The whole experience. Well, thank you again. Good to talk to you, Pam. Um, take care. You as well. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Why Not Both. If you liked what you heard, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your preferred podcast platform. You can also come hang out with us on social media. We are at WNB the podcast, both on Instagram and on Twitter. This season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar magazine. Under the Radar is a nationally distributed print, music, and entertainment magazine and website. You can find them at www.undertheradarmag.com and feel free to support them on Patreon. Extra special thanks to our producer, Laura Studeris, who is literally a rock star. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you next episode. Thank you.